Thank you very much for um, participating in our Medicare 101 program. I am Nancy Broughton Munson at the Elk Grove Village Public Library, obviously at home now as we venture into our new era of programming remotely. And so thank you for joining us on Zoom tonight for this program, Medicare 101, with David Wiley and Robin Dawson, um, independent insurance brokers with Medicare Solutions Network. We've had David and Robin at the library many times in the past, over the past many years. And um, they always draw a huge crowd because they make the very confusing or sometimes confusing topic of Medicare um, very understandable. And um, so we will, we're happy to have them with us tonight so that we can all um, learn more from them about Medicare. So uh, you have a, the chat feature where you may ask questions and David and Robin will be monitoring that um, chat to answer your questions along the way. And with that, I will hand it over to David and Robin. Thank you very much. Thanks, Nancy. And I want to thank you especially for getting us up and running virtually. We're really excited to be able to do this for the Elk Grove Village uh, Library patrons and anyone else who joined us tonight. So um, like Nancy said, we are definitely encouraging your questions. Um, just because you're muted upon entry doesn't mean that we don't want to hear from you. We think it uh, is great and, and provides a lot of value. So please feel free to use the chat. We'll be monitoring that throughout. And we're going to take breaks um, after each part of the presentation and address those questions as they come in. We'll do our best to get to all of them. For those that we don't get to, uh, you can please feel free to email us or call us afterward. Um, if you have something that's more specific to your individual situation, we're happy to address those offline but we will uh, be taking breaks so we can continue to address questions and share the answers with the group. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to David to get us started. Cool, thanks Robin. Good evening everybody, thank you for coming. Um, in these unusual times, normally we would meet you in, in, a, in a room and we'd all be sitting there together, but now we're doing this a little bit differently. But still the basic idea here this evening is to give you an overview of the world of Medicare. There's no way that we can cover everything, but what we wanna to try to do here tonight is to make it dangerous. Uh, Nancy mentioned the fact that Robin and I are both insurance brokers. Don't let that scare you. There's nothing for sale here tonight. Just knowledge and try to bring you up to speed into a world where um, it comes at you pretty fast. Uh, as you turn 65, your mailbox fills up with information or really it's propaganda from the insurance companies. Your phone rings off the hook and frequently people will get uh, make mistakes in this world and make less than fully informed decisions. And We've always said that Medicare is a world of partial sentences and half-truths and floating asterisks that you wouldn't even know were there if you didn't know who to ask. And that's what Robin and I do. We try to help navigate people through this world. And I assure you, as you approach 65, your friends and your neighbors, they all mean you well, and they try to tell you what to do, but frequently they don't even know what they've done. Um, typically, you've gotten your insurance from your employer, and the employer has come to you once a year and says, here it is, take it or leave it. Well, of course you're gonna take it, it's a great benefit, but all of the things that went into that insurance product, deductibles, co-insurance, co-payments, networks, drug programs, wellness benefits, all that was pre predetermined for you. And now you get to make those decisions. And it can be a little bit scary, but let's start with a basic premise. Medicare is a great program. It's totally customizable to whatever you want it to be, and we can change it through the aging process. There's no mistakes that you could make that can't be corrected further down the road, but it's sure smart to make fully informed decisions at the very beginning. And one of the things you want to know is that all that information that's showing up in your mailbox, it truly is, it's advertising, it's propaganda. What you'd want to do is you'd, you'd want to refer to the information that's provided to you by your new best friend in the world. That's Medicare. There's a new sheriff in town, and when you come to Medicare, they're running the show, not the insurance companies, and it's a beautiful thing. The cornerstone of Medicare is competition and transparency, and many companies want your business, and you have to decide where to place that business, and that's where Robin and I would help. Uh, as brokers, we represent all the companies in the marketplace, not just one or two. I would suggest to you, you'd want to stay away from what are called captive agents. These are people that only represent one company. 
you're doing yourself a disservice if you're not looking at the entire field of play and all the companies that are there. This right here, this Medicare and you, this is truly the Bible of our industry. All that other stuff that you're getting is, is really truly propaganda and advertising. But here is a source of information, the encyclopedia of Medicare, where you can find answers to, to all the questions that you would have. It's, it's backed up by the world's easiest phone number, 1-800-MEDICARE. You should write that down. And those folks are there 24 hours a day. And just like Jake from State Farm, they're waiting for your call at two in the morning. And they can answer questions for you. And you can find the, the truth of what's going on here in this book. And the book is also backed up by an excellent website. This is medicare.gov. And please notice the difference, G-O-V, not C-O-M. Medicare.com is a sales site and people will go there and be surprised when they look for information and they wind up getting sales calls. I would strongly suggest that it's in your best interests to try to stay away from these websites that offer you free quotes because all they're gonna do is sell your information to a bunch of other agents and they're gonna bury you with even more phone calls. This website is full of great information. These are all drop down menus. You can really get fully informed. You could download that book. If you could scroll all the way down to the bottom, you could get that Medicare and you book. But the, the, the tool that we really love about this website is down here where you see find plans. That gives us the ability to shop your drug programs. One of the components of Medicare would be the necessity of having a drug program. And Medicare assists by giving us the ability to see every drug program and what they would be uh, charging you for the next year of coverage. Every year with the drug programs, you would make your initial decision, but then every year you get a do-over during the annual election period. And that runs from October 15th to December 7th. You have the ability to change your drug program guaranteed every year. And it's critically important to take a look at that every year to make sure you're getting maximum value. We try to do that for all of our clients to make sure that they're up to speed. You can do it yourself. You can do it at 1-800-MEDICARE, or you could do it through one of these SHIP counselors that uh, are at different county facilities that would help you. They could also do that for you. This is where your journey begins. This is your Medicare card. And we've seen a tectonic shift over the last 15 years where most people, if you go back in time, I'll bet if you looked at your parents' Medicare card, their Part A and Part B effective dates would have been exactly the same date. And that would be the first day of the month in which they turned 65. That's when you can first get Medicare. In that world, our parents would have gotten to 65 and they would have retired, likely gone fishing with the grandkids. In this world, they would have started their A and their B as of the first day of the month that they turned 65. And that's how Medicare works. It's always the first day of the month. Whether you were born on the 23rd or the 28th, you'd still carry an effective date of the first day of the month in which you turned 65. A and B comprise the foundation of Medicare. We've got to have that to do anything else. They won't send you this card automatically unless you're receiving Social Security benefit payments. If you are, and they can get this premium for Part B, they'll go ahead and send it to you automatically. But if you haven't started your Social Security benefits, you would, could log on to Medicare. You could go right here, get started with Medicare, and right online, you could sign up for this Medicare A and B to start as of the first day of the month in which you turn 65. A and B cover us for different stuff, and we're going to tear that apart here in a second. But what you want to know is that this is a place where people can frequently make their first fairly significant mistake in the world of Medicare. A has no premium, and it can't really hurt you to turn that on when you're turning 65. But this B, you might choose to hold off on activating. Why would that be? That would be because you continue to work. Most baby boomers are in better shape at 65 than their parents were at 55, and they've decided to continue to work. They like the job, they like the socialization, they love the money, and as a result, they could stay on that employer coverage. And as long as that employer coverage consists of more than 20 employees, that would be considered creditable coverage and would allow you the ability to not activate that Part B. We want to look at what the comparison is between what your employer is offering and what you might get through the world of Medicare. You might get better value here, but you might also do better to stay with your employer plan. 
The problem here is that your friends will berate you. The people that you know will tell you that you must activate A and B when you turn 65, or there could be penalties and the world will fall down upon your head. But that's not true. If you have this creditable coverage, you could avoid activating B. No penalties as long as you continue to work there and you've got your coverage there. No penalties and the ability to activate Part B farther down the road. You wouldn't need Part B with your creditable coverage because that would stand in primary position. And we see people make this mistake far too frequently. They come to 65, they activate A and B, and they continue to work. And last annual election period, we had a gentleman at 82, he finally decided to come off of his wife's group insurance. And I looked at his card and my heart sank because he had activated his Medicare Part B when he turned 65. He never needed to do that, and yet he paid Part B premiums for the entire time that he was on his wife's creditable coverage and could have avoided making those payments. In the world of Medicare, it's always good to be ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. And you have certain enrollment periods when you first come to Medicare. Sign up in the first three months before your birth month, you're great. You go effective immediately on the first day of the, the month you turn 65. Wait into that fifth month, they'll let you go effective that next month. But you wait longer out into these other months, you'll have delays that you don't want to deal with. We always suggest this is a really good time to have a group meeting with Medicare and figure out exactly what you want to do when you turn 65. We'd like to have those conversations with you at least 90 days out from your 65th birthday. That Part B we talked about has a premium, and that base premium this year is $144.60 per person per month. But you know how the government works. They need money to make this thing work, and the more you make, the more they're going to take based upon your income, your modified adjusted gross income. And how does that work? Well, the government in 2020 can only see your 2019 returns. That's all their computers show them. The, ninth, the 2019 returns actually show you what, what you made in 2018. So you'd see here that in 2020, they're looking back into what you made in 2018, and they have different thresholds for your income. This is called IRMA, your income-related monthly adjustment amount. You need to be aware of this. Many people aren't, and they're surprised when they come to the world of Medicare because everybody they know is paying a certain amount and they could be paying higher amounts and that would be predicated upon your income. Be aware of this and watch this. At 63, 64, 65, you're making financial decisions that can have a ramification on what you'll pay for your Part B coming down the road. You want to be very careful about that. In this world, you can appeal these higher amounts based upon what's called a life-changing event. Certainly, you might have killed it in 2018 and you did great in 2019, but now it's 2020 and you've retired. That's why you're coming to Medicare. Well, if you've retired, your income likely is going to drop. Not to worry, the government will catch up to that. It's going to take them two years of returns to figure this out, but we would rather see you file an appeal and we can send you that form. There's a formal appeal process to drive down the fact that now you actually are really making less money and you should pay less on your Part B. They also hit you on the Part D as well. I love my government. I just don't want to give them one more nickel than they're already taking. And here we have the roadmap of Medicare. Hopefully you guys all got one of these. But in this world, we see here now how the whole world lays out. A and B are going to form the foundation and we're going to tear that apart here in a second. But Robin, have we got any questions about what we've just covered? We do, actually. So situation that's fairly common, someone decides to work past age 65, they're turning 65 in a few months, are going to continue to work until perhaps 70. Um, their understanding is that they can continue to keep their coverage and avoid any late enrollment penalty in Medicare. Their current employer, and this is key, has 20 or more employees. Perfect. So that would qualify as creditable coverage and they are actively working. If this individual was continuing to work, was not continuing to work and perhaps their employer was just of letting them extend their group coverage into their retirement, they'd need to get to Medicare and make Medicare primary. So just to clarify on yeah, that. You need, you need and then we had another quick question there. about a person being in between jobs. And so do you wanna address the special enrollment opportunity again, David? 
Well, if you're coming off of group insurance and you've got that creditable coverage, that's that's withheld your place to come to this world of Medicare and activate your Medicare further down the road. There's two forms that you need to do that. We can send them to you or you can get them at that Medicare.gov website. But one form you would then fill out saying, I'm ready now, I wanna start my part B. But the other form that we'll need is, a, is an attestation from your current employer saying, yep, they were here, yep, they were covered, yep, they, they had creditable coverage. Those two forms together go into the Earth so Social Security office. At this point in time, we're faxing those in. But those forms would be enough proof for you to be able to activate your Medicare without penalty, without delay. And that's what's so critically important. Good, Rob? Yep, we're good. Good. So here we're going to have A and B as our foundation. And in that world, A and B, I would tell you, is really good, but it's not complete. And to make other decisions, we need to figure out exactly what we're getting through A and B. Once you have A and B in place, and we'll see that it's not complete, you have two different pathways to potentially travel for your additional coverage. One pathway called Original Medicare, and one pathway called Medicare Advantage. You do one or the other. They're different, but they're both getting at the same purpose of providing you for coverage in the world of Medicare. We'll talk about all of that here tonight, but let's start with the basics. What do you get from the federal government for your 144.60 per month? Medicare Part A. If there was one word for A, you'd put down facilities, all of the buildings that you come into contact with. That's what's covered by Part A. Hospitalization, but that's not free. Skilled nursing facility, but you've got a co-payment. Home health services and hospice. These are all facilities and these are all under Part A. A has no premium. I always get a kick out of agents when they tell you it's free. It's not free. You paid a boatload in taxes. They just don't charge you more when you come to the party. And that's why activating A can make sense when you're turning 65. This, this A has exposure though, and that's what this looks like. If you go spend one night in the hospital this year, and all you have is original Medicare, there's a copayment. That first night in the hospital costs you $1,408. Now, that $1,408 for one night seems kind of stiff, but know that that $1,408 would actually cover you for up to 60 nights in the hospital for that one copayment, and on discharge continues to cover you for 60 days. So you go in for your appendectomy and it, you're, it goes well, but you're still there, you're two nights. The first night you pay the 1408, the second night is covered because you made your copayment. You go home and everything is fine. Um, and three weeks later, you've got nothing better to do. You decide to have a heart attack and go back into the hospital. You're still within your benefit window. They wouldn't charge you the 1408 again. But on day 61, bing, whoop, that whole thing resets and you could conceivably hit this several times in a year. From the hospital, you might discharge into skilled nursing, and that's a, a wonderful benefit. Medicare will pay for the first 20 days, and you'd have no copayments there. But then we get to the next 80 days, and Medicare says, well, we need you to pony up a copayment of $176 per night. And note that after 100 nights, Medicare does not cover long-term care insurance. They don't cover assisted living. That's then going to be all on you. And if you haven't looked at long-term care insurance, you probably should. In the world of Medicare, there are, are any number of asterisks and partial sentences and, and, and half truths. And here we need to put an asterisk because you would want to know the rules of engagement. This is a great benefit, but to get this benefit, you need to be admitted into the hospital for three nights. Note the difference between being admitted, there's something that we're going to go get and fix, and the other possibility of being held overnight under observational status. Observational status means we're not really sure what's going on. We'd be feeling better if you were closer to the emergency room. Observational stays do not tick the three nights necessary to get this benefit. Be very careful, always in the world of healthcare. You're showing that card, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And who's paying for it? Home health services, brilliant, brilliant benefit. We'll send a medical professional right to your front door and they would help you with major stuff on a short-term basis. They're not coming over to do the dishes. In this world, you're looking at things like maybe a handful of physical therapy visits or, or maybe wound dressing, but it's a short-term benefit for major stuff, but again, you pay nothing for that. And then we put down 5% for hospice, hardly fair. Medicare picks up almost everything, but there can be a very small co-payment for the medications that you might take to remain comfortable before you pass away.
there's a wonderful benefit, no charge to you on a premium basis, but you do have exposure that we have to be protected from. Medicare Part B, one word for Medicare Part B would be services, all the services that you're gonna come into contact with, all of the doctors that you see, all of the specialists that you see, whether you saw them in the hospital or you saw them in their office, they're actually billing up under B. There was a, a, an anesthesiologist who knocked you out so a surgeon could operate on you. Well, wait a second, that happened in the hospital. Yeah, but that's the facility charge. That's the building. That's the, the, the gurney, the bright lights. Everybody that worked on you comes up under B. All of your lab work, everything from a blood test to a biopsy. All of your diagnostic testing, that's the expense of alphabet soup, EKG, EEG, MRI, CAT scan, X-ray. Durable medical equipment. Maybe you need a walker or a wheelchair, or maybe in the, in the hospital, you've got a brand new knee or a pacemaker. That's durable medical equipment. Physical therapy, the emergency services, the ambulance that takes you to the emergency room, outpatient services, that would be like a colonoscopy or maybe a scoping of the knee or something of that nature. And the final part of B is critically important. It's called clinical RX. These are medications that are delivered in a doctor's office, an outpatient setting, or in the hospital. And typically, these are the scary ones. Chemotherapy, kidney dialysis, radiation treatment, big ticket items, Medicare's got your back under Part B. These are different than the medications that we're gonna get from a Part D drug prescription program. The drug prescription programs are for the things that you're getting at Walgreens or Juul Osco for high blood pressure or high cholesterol. This is the heavy duty stuff. And remember, if it's administered in a doctor's office or an outpatient setting, it builds up under B. And that can be critically important when we look to make fully informed decisions and save money down the road. Part B has a premium. 144.60 per month is the base, but it's graded for income. But it also has exposure. Part B has the premium, and you also have an annual deductible on all of these services. It's kind of a crazy number, but it's true. $198 annually. Uh, I don't think you could find any doctor that would see you for under $300. I don't think you can find a blood panel that retails for less than $200. But you'd pay the first $198. After that, Medicare's going to step in and start splitting bills with you. They'll pick up $0.80 cents on the dollar. They'll hold you responsible for $0.20. Cents. The good news here, and it's phenomenal, it's an unlimited benefit. If you need five knee replacements, Medicare is going to cover those five knee replacements. But remember, on every one of those five knee replacements, you're going to have the 1408 every 61 days, the 176 if you stay longer in skilled nursing, the 5% on the copay for the hospice if you need it, the $198 deductible. But really, the one that concerns us is this 20%, because the unlimited benefit has unlimited exposure. And that's the critical component of why we need to think about adding additional coverage to original Medicare. And what you do there is you look to pick up more coverage in this field of play that we look at here. Robin, any questions? Yes, we have one from Peter who's asking if the skilled nursing benefit uh, restarts each year. Every 61 days on the skilled nursing. But again, you'd still need the three-night stay, the, 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 the three-night stay that, that is, is not the outpatient stay, but it's got to be, you've got to be admitted into the hospital overnight for three nights to get that to reset. Good? Yep. Cool. A and B, really good, but A and B, not complete. We need to pick up additional coverage to be fully covered. One pathway called original Medicare. In addition to this new world where Medicare steps in, they're the new sheriff, they run the show. And in that world, the first thing you'd want to know is that you've now become part and parcel of the largest provider network known to mankind. Any doctor, any hospital, anywhere in the United States, they take Medicare and you're in. But because it's not complete, we'd look to pick up more coverage and we'd look to pick up what's called a Medicare supplement. A supplement also known as a Medigap plan, is something that you get from a private insurance company that could step in and fill up, take care of that exposure that you have with A and B that we just covered. Good, but not complete. 
these supplements brought to us by private insurance companies, but the beauty of the system is that Medicare dictates how these programs work, not the insurance companies. And all of these companies are forced onto a level field of play, and this is the world of Medicare supplements. We call them supplements because they supplement A and B. We call them Medigap plans because they fill in the gaps. We use that term interchangeably just to confuse you, calling the same thing two names, but that's what these are. These are Medigap plans. Medicare allows 10 different packages of benefits to come to market. We've just discussed what A and B cover, and then Medicare allows these different packages. And, and people go crossways here because why are there so many? Because different people have different needs. But if you were to circle the big three, you'd, you'd cover about 90% of all supplements that have been sold over the last 10 years. F and G and N have dominated the market for years. F now is no longer being marketed to new enrollees as of January 1st, 2020. If you've already come to Medicare before Jan or you turned 65 before January 1st, you can still get this F. And for the longest time, it was the gold standard. People loved it because it was so simple to understand. With F, it would literally step in and cover all of that A and B stuff that we talked about. You would have no deductible, no coinsurance, no copayments. I joke to people, it's unlike any coverage you've ever had before in your life, unless maybe you were a member of Congress at one point in time. But this F now has fallen out of favor because it became so expensive. And now that it's no longer marketed to new enrollees, people have turned to what was the better option in our opinion all the way along. This G represents better value because G does almost everything F does. Wait a second, there's an empty box there. What is that? F pays for it, but you'd reach into your pocket and you'd pay for the Part B deductible. If you were to write $198 in there, you'd have a deductible. And just like your automobile insurance or your homeowners, that's going to drive your premiums down significantly. All the companies that were, that were fighting in this, this F business, now they've all moved over here into this G world. And these prices have actually been dropping over the last six months because it's so competitive. The beauty of the system. Medicare says what G is not the insurance companies. So when you look at G, and wait a second, you're telling me that G from Blue Cross Blue Shield is similar to G from Mutual of Omaha? Not similar, identical, because Medicare says what G is. But wait a second, I know my doctor takes Blue Cross Blue Shield, does my doctor take Mutual of Omaha? No, sir, wrong question. Does your doctor take Medicare? This is now your insurance. Medicare is the provider. All the supplements are doing is stepping in behind and picking up some or all of the exposure that we discussed with A and B. A deductible, driving down premiums, makes sense. We can show you that financially, but maybe, just maybe, if your health is really good, you might even accept a little bit more exposure, dig a little bit deeper into your pocket, and you might consider the N as in Nancy. Nancy is very similar to what you probably had coming off your group insurance, and Nancy says you're going to accept not only the deductible, that same Part B deductible, $198, but in addition to that, you're going to agree to copayments. And you see that down here at the bottom of the page. After you've paid the $198 deductible, you've got $20 doctor visits for a specialist or for a primary and a $50 copayment if you go into the emergency room. If you know anything about insurance, those are very negligible amounts to be able to have great coverage, and that would drive your premiums down. This G that we talked about comes in really two flavors. Standard G has a $198 deductible. After that, everything's covered with regards to facilities and services. But they see that little asterisk there. G also comes in a high deductible format. And that's a little bit different idea. You're going to dig deeper into your pocket and you agree to an out-of-pocket exposure of $2,340. That might be scary for you. For me, I'm on the Affordable Care Act. I pay $1,000 a month to carry a $7,000 deductible. $2,340 looks pretty good to me. Might not be your cup of tea, but again, you would see that amount of exposure driving your premiums down dramatically. We've got 39 companies here, all of whom want your business, all beating each other over the head. We would tell you our recommendation would be of the 39, 
There's really three that we prefer because they're the largest and they've got the biggest risk pools that got the most modest of rate increases. In this world of supplements, you're gonna wanna be sure to understand that these prices will go up. They've gotta go up. We've got 10,000 baby boomers a day turning 65. In that world, we know that that's price pressure and we know that these prices will go up. We tell our clients, you've gotta figure an inflation factor of somewhere between five to 8% every year on everything medical. We work with a lot of financial planners. They're putting in a straight 10% every year, everything medical, simply based upon the crush of the baby boomers. They're more conservative, certainly, because they have to be sure you don't run out of money. But don't think that these things won't increase as we age. I like the idea of spending less money here simply because we do know that these are going to go up. With your activation of Part B, all of these are available to you, guaranteed, can't be denied for six months before you activate B to six months after you activate B. Go anywhere you want to go. They got to take it. It's the law. People will have the misconception that after that six-month period, every year they get a do-over during that annual election period. That's not true. With the supplements, you get that one golden ticket. One full year, six months before, six months after you activate B. But after that, you can still change these every month of the year. But these guys can ask you medical questions and they can rate you up or they can decline your coverage. That's what makes that first decision point extremely important. 39 companies duking it out currently in Illinois that want your business on this field of play. But you really want to be able to see what they're all doing. And it's not just who has the lowest price. It's who has the best track record of the lowest rate increases and are the steady players that have been in the market for years. That's where we would suggest that you place your business. A and B, not complete. So we look to pick up a Medicare supplement, but we're still going to need one more piece of this puzzle to make this thing swing. But before we move on, do we have questions on supplements? We do, um, specifically related to the foreign travel emergency and the definition thereof. Do you want to take that? And then we have a few others that came in related to A and B coverage. Gotcha. Foreign travel emergency says that you're in Spain and you break your leg. We'll cover you with this, these products that have the foreign travel emergency benefit. You're still going to have to pay the bill there. They don't know what Medicare is in Spain, but as long as it's an emergency, pay the bill there, bring it back here. This coverage says that after a $250 deductible, they will then split the bill with you 80-20, up to a lifetime maximum of $50,000. But be cautious. Uh, it's, it's good in an emergency. But remember, as you wheel out of the hospital and they fixed your broken leg, where'd your cruise ship go? I would always recommend that you might want to think about getting travel insurance when you take the trip of a lifetime. We had a personal experience with that. It served us quite well. Um, so one of the questions that came in just to the panelists that I answered offline but I think has value for everyone is with respect to health savings accounts. Correct. Someone had the understanding that, you know, I contributing to an HSA through their employer, they can't keep doing that if they go to Medicare, and that is true. That's correct. If you turn on Medicare Part A, it no longer allows you to contribute to an HSA tax-free. Now, you can continue to use that money. You can use it to pay premiums and, and healthcare expenses, but you can't contribute tax-free. So the important thing to know is just time it correctly. You'll see in a lot of the Medicare publications, they'll tell you to stop contributing to your HSA six months ahead of when you plan to enroll. And that's because what people don't often realize is that their Medicare Part A effective date can be retroactively um, started as far as six months back, but no further than the first of the month in which you turn 65. Another question came in with respect to uh, Diabetic supplies, specifically insulin pumps, lancets, test strips. Yes, those are all considered durable medical equipment DMA, subject yep. to Medicare Part B deductible and coinsurance. Sure. Even though like the lancet, lancets and test strips you get at the pharmacy, um, those are still considered DME. Sure, and COPD mach machinery and stuff as well. 
Right. We did have another question come in uh, during the annual election period. David asked, can you change your medical Medicare supplement selection from the prior year? Yes. And the answer, the answer there is you can change it every month of the year, right. but they can ask you medical questions. You only get one freebie period, and that's six months before you activate Part B, six months after you activate Part B. You can go to any company that offers any of these products but once that six month after activation B goes away, now you have limited choices. In Illinois, you've got 39 companies and 38 out of 39 would ask you medical questions. There's only one company that doesn't ask medical questions, but we always have the ability to make a move. It's subject to your health, really. The two things that'll save you a fortune here, your health and your ability to understand how to make moves in this field when it makes sense. There was a clarification question asked about plans C and F, and it has less to do with when you enrolled in B and when you actually became eligible based on your age. So anyone who reached, reached their age eligibility for Medicare, meaning they turned 65 prior to January 1st of 2020, those individuals still have the option to purchase plan C and F on the supplement landscape if they so choose. It's they just purchase. individuals who, whose age eligibility is after that date where they don't have the option to get those plans. Further, if someone is in Medicare and doesn't have those plans and they wanna buy those plans, they too can also get those plans. Sure, but again, we would always caution, look for the value equation. Mm -hmm. And you'll have a lot of your friends that have F and they'll rave it up, never see a bill. And I agree, they get those five knee replacements, they never see a bill, it's phenomenal. But when you look at what you're getting from F and compare it to what you're getting from G, the only difference is that G holds you responsible for this year, it's $198 deductible. The difference is in the premiums. That G is going to be about $50 less per month, ballpark, but a good ballpark you're gonna save way more in premiums by agreeing to pay a very small deductible. This G has been a better value for years and most people don't realize it because as insurance agents, what you'll find is we're compensated by the insurance companies. There's never a charge to you to work with us, nor should there be. But the insurance companies reimburse us based upon what you spend. So for a lot of agents for years, this F has been the gold standard. Why? Because it was clearly the most expensive and paid the highest commissions. Drives me crazy, but for a lot of folks, they took this F when they really didn't need it. This G is a better value because you save $600 a year because you gave back $200 a year. It's a better value, okay? Good, Rob? Yes, we're good on questions. Okay, so let's see if we can do this. And you should have control. Robin's gonna to talk to us a little bit now about Part D drug prescription programs and how those work. Oops. There you go. Medicare Part D, this is the third component to your path in original Medicare. In 2006, uh, the federal government finally realized that with the rising cost of prescription drug coverage, Medicare A and B did not really help the population of people that were in Medicare with the escalating cost of prescription drugs. So they brought to the forefront Medicare Part D it is the one piece that the federal government does want you to get in addition to A and B when you're first eligible and they'll penalize you for it. We'll talk about that in a minute if you don't get it right away. Uh, and like supplements, it's offered by private insurance companies. So all the same players that you'll see selling Medicare supplements also sell, sell Medicare Part D. There is a master formulary of all common prescription drugs that are taken by people as they age, and that's set by Medicare. And every year they tweak it a little bit, and they publish it on Medicare.gov, which is a good a tool and resource for people to research these plans. 
But off of that master formulary, each individual insurance company decides where they're going to carve out their niche and where they're going to compete. So each of these plans covers a, a different subset of that formulary. And some companies have decided to go after prescription drugs that are, oh, I didn't advance that, did you guys? I guess we no. did. No. Um, some people can decide that they want a plan that is really good at covering generics and others um, might want to get a plan that's really good at covering brand name drugs. But each of these plans decide how they're going to compete with one another and they sort of carve out that niche. So just know that not every plan covers this, the same subset of drugs off of the master formulary. However, they do all have stages of coverage. Medicare Part D is broken up into four stages of coverage. And, and this is articulated here on the second page of your handout. I don't know why the slide keeps advancing, but it does. I think we've got control, Rob. Okay, so could you go back for a second though? Um, so we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail, but the one thing I wanted to point out about these stages of coverage and why I have an asterisk here is because there are some plans that don't have the deductible stage, but very few, and you will typically see higher premiums on those plans, but they, but they are available. I would say about three quarters of all Part D drug plans that are in the market this year have a deductible phase. As I mentioned, there's a late enrollment penalty. If you don't get prescription drug coverage when you come off of other plans that might include drug coverage and when you first enroll in Medicare, there will be a silent penalty that sort of calculates in the background for every month that you didn't have coverage that you could have had coverage. And it gets assessed when you finally do enroll in Medicare Part D. And so what I will tell you is it's a negligible pen penalty. It's, this year it was about 35, 38 cents a month. It's typically the 10% of the average Part D premium in a given calendar year. However, a lot of people will come to Medicare and they're relatively healthy. They're not taking any prescription drugs and they figure, well, I'm just gonna save myself the money. And I've seen this go sideways on people quite often. They wait you know, five, six, seven years and then they get a prescription that gets prescribed by their doctor that is relatively expensive. And two things happen. They try to jump into Medicare Part D um, outside of the annual enrollment period or outside of a special enrollment period and they can't get coverage so they have to wait and pay full retail value for that prescription until they can get into the into a plan and then once they get into the plan that's when Medicare's going to assess that penalty and unfortunately they'll calculate those 35 or 38 cents every month for every year that you didn't have coverage and they will add it to your premium in perpetuity for the rest of your life. So it's not a one-time hit. And I've seen people's penalties far exceed their Medicare Part D premiums in a given month. So do yourself a favor, avoid the penalty. The drug plans this year uh, gave you a fairly low cost to entry to avoid that penalty. Uh, they started out at $13.20 a month and they go all the way up to $130 some dollars a month and everything in between. So there, there really is something there for everyone and truly it is a great place for you to customize your coverage and to save some money. This is a plan that unlike supplements where you can revisit your coverage every month out of the year if you want, you, Medicare Part D plans run on a calendar year. So the only time once you initially enroll, either during your initial enrollment period to Medicare or during a special enrollment when you perhaps might leave employer coverage, the only other time you can get a Medicare Part D plan or change your Medicare Part D plan is that annual election period between October 15th and December 7th. And making your change during that time will start your benefits on January 1st of the, of the next calendar year. So David, if you're still in control of the screen, thanks. So this is the third page of the handout that was sent to you all before the presentation, but this just gives you a, a more in-depth look of what these stages of coverage under Medicare Part D look like. And as I mentioned, while each plan itself might have a different formulary and might have different deductibles and coinsurance and, um, and premiums, they're all gonna have these stages of coverage for the most part. Some may not have this initial stage or the annual deductible. Medicare sets this deductible. This year it's $435 a month. 
and it typically falls on medications that are in the higher tiers, so the brand and specialty category, and we'll talk about the tiers in a minute. But most people will pay for those higher tiers of drugs before they fulfill that deductible. Now, you, there are some plans in the marketplace this year where there are lower deductibles, but generally most plans follow that Medicare established deductible, and this year it was 435. Once that deductible is filled, if you're filling anything in the brand category or above, then you'll move into the initial stage of coverage. And when you're in this stage of coverage, which is where most people begin their Part D plan, you're gonna be paying a copay for your medications. So you might be acquiring $500 in retail value worth of medications, but your prescription drug plan that maybe costs you $25 a month for the insurance is allowing you to fill those drugs at a preferred pharmacy for $75. But Medicare actually isn't tracking the $75 that you're paying for those medications out of pocket. They're tracking the $500 that those medications are worth. And they're calculating that amount every time you fill your medications. And when you reach $4,020 in this calendar year, 2020, in value of drugs that you fill, that's when Medicare is gonna say, okay, now you're moving from the initial stage of coverage into the coverage gap or donut hole. And I'm sure many of you have heard from friends or family members that enter the gap in a given year that this isn't the, the funnest place to be. And that's because Medicare looks for you to contribute a higher cost share when you're in this stage of coverage. They ask you to contribute 25% of the value of your drugs. Now in years prior, these percentages used to be a little bit different. You used to pay a higher amount on generics because they were relatively inexpensive and a lower, uh, a 25% amount on, on brands. This year, we saw that normalize to 25% across the board. So again, you'll pay 25% of the retail value of both your generics and your brand name drugs that you're filling until your out of pocket total is reaches that threshold of 6350. And then you'll finally move into catastrophic coverage, which is where you'll get rate relief and the cost of all of your prescriptions will go down. The rub about these stages of coverage and what frustrates people a lot is that most people who enter the coverage gap do so late summer, early fall, and then they never get to that next threshold before the end of the year. Conversely, we've seen people who are on very expensive medications and in the first or second fill at the beginning of a year, they might blow through all their stages of coverage by you know, the third or fourth month. But that's, I would say, the exception, not the norm. So one of the things that we try to help people do is make a good decision about Part D and pick a plan that really does a couple of things for sure covers all of their prescription drugs, but we also help show them strategies that might either delay their entrance into the coverage gap or push it off entirely um, so they don't fall into it in a given calendar year. So one of the ways that we help them do that is by going back to our good old friend, Medicare.gov. And so... Well, well, I can't. Okay. Right here. So the Find Health and Drug Plans tab right here is where we typically have people go. And when we click into that screen and we get to the next one, it'll basically ask us to, oh, go back to the previous screen. It'll ask people to put in, um, you can continue without logging in and it'll ask you to put in your zip code and then your medications. If you have a fairly robust list of prescription drugs, I would highly encourage you to, to use that white button and log in and create an account because if you, all it will do is it'll give you direct access then to your list of prescription drugs. And if you have 10 or 12 prescriptions that you're filling with regularity, every time you go back to medicare.gov, you're gonna to have to re-enter them every single time. So it might be good to set up a, a, an account initially when you do your research. Um, that's the only information that it'll retrieve for you is that list that you type in. Um, but let's go back, David, a, a couple of slides because I just wanna talk real quick about the tiers. So as I mentioned before, Medicare sets a master formulary of all prescription drugs. And those drugs are tiered on a five-tier system. Many of us are familiar with a three-tier system, which is what most of our employer group insurance plans have. They have generics, 
uh, brands and then specialty meds. But to facilitate more competition in the pharmaceutical industry, Medicare breaks out our medications into five tiers. So your tier one, tier two preferred generics are gonna represent a lower cost share to you. And I would even say in, in many cases this year, we've seen prescription drug plans under Medicare Part D that if you're filling at a preferred pharmacy partner, you can get tier one preferred generics at no cost share. Tier two non-preferred generics haven't been in generic status as long as the preferred generics, and so you may pay five, six, seven dollars in, in a copay to fill those. And then when you get into the preferred brand category, that's where you might pay a little bit more, anywhere between 25 to 45, 50 dollars a month. Those typically are the uh, brand name of drugs that you see advertised on TV. And then your tier four non-preferred brands are going to be the ones that have come right out of clinical trial or FDA approval. They really are, are being advertised on TV by famous spokespeople to encourage you to try them out. And uh, they typically have a higher price tag. You're looking at close to $100 in, in terms of a copay for a tier four drug. And then tier five are your specialty medications. So in this category, you'll find things like oral chemotherapy, um, maybe AIDS medication or medication after transplant, still covered under the Medicare formulary, albeit at a higher cost share to you. So if we wanna go back to medicare.gov, we find health and drug plans, we type in our zip code, and then we start to punch in um, our medications based on what we're taking. We put in the name, the dose, and how often we take it. And then it'll push out a screen like this that gives us our list of medications and tells us at CVS, which we, you, you can select up to three different pharmacies, including mail order. It'll show you which pharmacy is treated on a preferred basis under a specific drug plan that you've selected from the offerings that are available. And, and typically when we put in a zip code in a given county, we'll get 26, 27 results come back. So like I said, there's, there's quite a bit of of variety and, and really a great opportunity to customize a drug plan to suit your needs. The first thing that, that we'll do when we sit down with our clients is we'll look at what they're filling and we'll look at the value of what they're acquiring, which is that total line under the monthly totals under the retail cost column. That is the amount that Medicare is tracking every time you fill your drugs to move you through those stages of coverage, okay? So in this case, this individual is filling a little bit over $500 worth of drugs, but for the premium that they're paying on this plan, which I think we, we don't have it captured in the screen grab here, but it's about $25, $30, they're able to fill all of those medications for a pretty nominal price after they fulfill their deductible. Now, what you'll see is Eliquis and things like ProAir looks to me that the, like those medications are at the tier three or higher level on this plan. Um, the Medicare plan finder will tell you what tier this prescription drug plan actually assigns your drugs. But in this case, the reason I, I'm knowing that is because the cost before deductible column is showing me that the first time this individual fills Eliquis or fills ProAir, they're going to pay full retail value for it until they reach that $435 threshold. And then the good news after that is those two prescriptions are gonna cost them $25 and the other two will cost zero. And they'll stay in that column, that cost after deductible column, which we've also called the initial stage of coverage until they've hit that threshold of the $4,028 worth of acquired drugs. And then they'll move into the coverage gap. And this is where you can see the conversion of now paying 25% retail for the, the Eliquis and the ProAir. Okay, the prices, well, actually the ProAir goes down a little bit, but the price of the Eliquis goes up significantly. Now down below, Medicare.gov will estimate for you um, when your, your total cost for your premium plus the cost to fill your medications. And what that's a representation of is the point in which you're going in and doing your research. So drug plans start on a calendar month. So if we ran, went in today onto medicare.gov and ran this, it's assuming we're starting our plan June 1st and it's giving us that balance of the year cost all combined. 
it's telling us when we're going to fall into the into the initial stage of coverage post our deductible and then it's also going to tell us about the month that we're going to fall into the coverage gap and the fact that we won't exit it before year end the important thing to know if you do fall into the gap is that that amount resets down to zero at the beginning of every calendar year and then medicare usually shifts those amounts so the 4,020 4, threshold to move from the initial stage to the gap and the 6,340 to move from the gap to catastrophic, those will adjust every calendar year slightly, not a, not a ton, but slightly. So one of the strategies that we might look at is there isn't currently a generic for Eliquis, but there, you know, for where you might be able to either do one of two things, have a meeting with your doctor to find out if you could tolerate the generic equivalent. You could certainly bring the retail cost of your drugs down, which would have a direct impact into how soon in a calendar year you might enter the coverage gap. And so that might be a great trade-off to make. The other thing you could look at is you could check out these wholesale sites like goodrx.com or blinkhealth.com and just do a reality check and see if some of the drugs that you're filling under Medicare Part D, you could actually get with just a GoodRx coupon in cash. Medicare really doesn't care how you fill your prescription drugs. You can run them through your plan or not. That's up to you. But if you have the opportunity to effectively be out of pocket the same amount paying for your drugs with, pers with a prescription in cash versus running them under your Medicare Part D plan, um, it, it might be a wise thing to, to do that because then you could be eliminating the retail value of, of one of your medications that might be pushing you into that coverage gap sooner rather than later. So these are different strategies that, that our clients will use um, to help manage their prescription drug costs throughout a calendar year. David, do we have any questions about Medicare Part D? You know, Robin, we lost the chat function, but I would say that that, uh, that GoodRx is very important. Whenever you find something that's gone generic, Medicare is traditionally pretty slow on these Part D drug programs to pick up the generic pricing. So that's always a dead giveaway. A good example right now would be Cialis and Viagra that have just gone generic. They're still being treated in most instances as very expensive drugs if you run it through the Part D, upwards of $100 a month. But those very same medications through GoodRx, you can get them for anywhere between $10 to $15. So to your point, always want to have a reality check on that. Are you able to pick up your chat function? I, I am, and I actually have a few questions that came in. So one of the questions was, where can I compare which drugs are carved out by each insurer? That's a, that's a little bit like finding a needle in a haystack. You really have to go to the drug formularies, which are published on all the carriers' websites. But one of the things that using Medicare.gov will tell you is when you type in your list of drugs, if it's not covered at all, by any plans, you're gonna see that because it will lower down. So you'll get a view of, of a screen that gives you this chart, but then below it, you'll see a chart that tells you this specific drug plan, how it tiers your medications. And if this, if one of your medications that you've typed in is not on the formulary for the plan that you've selected, it's gonna say not covered further down on this screen. So and that's also, probably the best way to that, find out. You'd also see that on this report where it would be the same price in every stage of coverage. That's a right. dead giveaway that it's not covered. That's a dead giveaway. Um, Humira is not considered a specialty drug, tier five. There are some plans, I believe, that have it at the tier four level, but it's still gonna be a pretty expensive medication. That was about all we have in the chat on Medicare Part D. Okay, good, good, good. So now we're back here. A and B didn't cover everything. So we went and we got ourselves a drug program and a supplement. And that's one pathway to travel. That's called original Medicare. Any doctor, any hospital, customizing a choice of 28 different drug programs specifically designed to your needs and a Medicare supplement that, again, is customizable to what you want it to be. And this is where most people are gonna start their journey. It's what your friends did, it's what your family did. 
and it's it's a comfort level knowing that you did what everybody else did. But it's also not unusual in this world where now you've got three parts to your coverage and you're paying a premium for that part D and you're paying a premium for that part, uh, that Medicare supplement, that the family that started here five or six or seven years ago, and we usually find a break point right around 70, 72, a lot of couples do a reality check and dad's sitting there at the kitchen table and he's saying, well, you know, when we first signed up for the supplement and the drug program, it was pretty reasonable. But now these rate increases have come through through the years. And now dad's sitting there with the calculator and, and the explanation of benefits. And, you know, honey, when we, we look at your supplement now, uh, you know, between your supplement and your drug program, we're paying close to $250 a month. And between my supplement and my drug program, we're paying another $250 a month. That's uh, 500 bucks a month. That's six grand a year. And we got to ask ourselves, you went to the doctor three times last year and I went twice or five doctor visits for six grand. Are we getting value? And that's where hopefully that we'll meet a lot of people in their 70s who are looking for rate relief. Maybe they chose that F. Maybe they don't need the F. Maybe the G makes sense. Or maybe even the N would make sense. And that's a good way to save money. Many people don't look at this drug program on a regular basis. And that's a mistake because that's low-hanging fruit. You can usually save a few dollars every year if you look at this. But instead of spending that money, there's also a possibility for a different way to run your coverage. Instead of having Medicare as your original program and these three pieces combining for your coverage, you might consider looking at what's called a Medicare Advantage program. It's a different idea. This is where the federal government is going to pay a private insurance company and they're going to step in and run the show. It's, it's got its pluses, it's got its minuses, but it's certainly worth discussing. Robin, could you tell us a little bit about those? Sure. So just like everything else that we've spoken about tonight, Medicare Part C, also known as Medicare Advantage, has its own set of rules, its own field of play, so to speak. And so we could advance the slide. So the first and foremost thing to know about Medicare Advantage plans is that these plans operate around a doctor network. So the most common types that you will see are HMOs or PPOs. There's also fee-for-service plans, but most people are familiar with the HMO and PPO model. In this world, you now can no longer see any doctor that accepts Medicare. You can see all the doctors that are either in your HMO plan, and typically in an HMO, you will be navigated within a single medical group because you will be required to get a referral from your primary care doctor. Or you might be in a PPO plan model where you still will want to be availing yourself of doctors that are in network on the plan because the minute you go out of network, your cost share will go up. But you won't necessarily need to be navigated by your, by your primary care physician. And so, you know, two different types of models. One of the things that David and I do when we sit down with clients, if they really like this model and they're interested in it, is we'll talk to them about their health and who the doctors are that are important to their care. Because if someone sits down and says to me, oh, I hate HMOs, but then they go on to say, but I love my primary care doctor and they're an advocate and so is my gastroenterologist and my, you know, ophthalmologist and my urologist. Well, you're already operating within an HMO, even though you don't think you are or you know so these plans are worth looking at um, if if you feel that a restrictive network of doctors is something that by design you don't feel encumbered by the second thing that's really important about these plans is unlike original Medicare where a and B get billed first and then your supplement is effectively just standing behind Medicare as a secondary payer for your bills, depending on the plan you've chosen. In Medicare Part C, because a private insurance company is running the show, they have established associated co-pays and co-insurance for every single service. And so it's more of a pay-as-you-go model. So one of the things we tell people is, if you want to reduce your monthly fixed cost, you can get a Medicare Advantage plan for a very low premium, and that might be one incentive and reason to, to look at these types of plans. But you have to realize that nothing in healthcare is free. And when you start using the healthcare system, you will have 
co-pays for everything you do. You may pay $20 for a lab test or $40 to see a specialist, $200 to spend a night in the hospital, $100 to take an ambulance ride, $200 to have an MRI. Everything will have an associated cost. So then people take a pause and they sometimes say, well, what if something happens, right? What if, what if I end up having to have an operation and I'm paying a lot of co-pays and co-insurance for things? Well, in that event, all of these plans have capped exposure or they have a max out of pocket amount. And this is familiar to most of us because most employer group plans also have this sort of firewall, so to speak, where all of your co-pays and co-insurance that you will pay out of pocket as you use the healthcare system will count toward this max out of pocket. And once you hit that firewall, you're done paying. Now, on an HMO plan design, you have one max out of pocket amount because you only have in-network benefits and you have to stay with in-network doctors. But if you're on a PPO plan, you might have two numbers. You'll have an in-network max and an in and out of network max. And I will tell you that on most plans, we typically see that in and out of network max be double or more of what the in-network max is. So you have to feel comfortable with those numbers. Another nice thing about these plans is that your drug coverage is included. So Medicare Part D is included in the benefits in most of the plans. There are a few that don't have them, but the majority of the plans do, so you don't have to go get that from another insurance company. They work the same way. The stages of coverage still exist. From time to time, we'll see Medicare Advantage plans that may have carved out a special unique offering for a certain category of medication, like maybe injectable insulin, you know, they'll treat those very favorably. Um, rarely, but from time to time, we'll find some sweet spots in some of these Medicare Advantage plans around the prescription drug coverage. And that might be a reason for you to look at them. But, you know, everybody's individual needs really do factor into whether or not this plan type will work with them. And just like the prescription drug plans, Medicare Part C also runs on a calendar basis. So these plans start in January, or if you're coming in during your initial enrollment period or a special enrollment period, they'll start at that time, but then they run for the calendar year. So your opportunity to change them is during that annual election period of October 15th to December 7th. Just like we see all the new drug plans get published in Medicare.gov around the first week of November, we also see the new Medicare Advantage plans Part C for the following calendar year about the same time. So you're able to kind of toggle back and forth. For most people who are in Medicare Advantage, your insurance company will send you what's called an annual notice of change prior to the annual election period. And they'll tell you how your benefits might be changing from the coming calendar year. So you can make a decision as to whether or not you wanna just let your plan roll over or if you wanna consider switching to something else. David, you wanna go to the next screen? So this is just a quick, um, view of what a PPO type plan looks like. Um, I, I show this to you primarily so you could see two things. The fact that there is an in and out of network benefit and the fact that you do have two max out of pocket amounts. Okay, and you, you really do have to feel comfortable with those numbers. The other thing from an illustration standpoint that I think this does a good job of showing is that even on PPO plans, you still want to do most things in network because you truly will extract the most value from these plans and will have the lowest cost sharing if all of your doctors are participating on an in network basis. These plans are sold by county and in any given zip code in the state of Illinois, there's probably 40 plans available. So there's a wide variety to choose from. Insurance companies um, are beating themselves over the head to win your business and it's a highly, highly competitive space. So there are great offerings, but there's a couple of things that you need to know about these plans besides the mechanics of how they work differently from original Medicare. You got to still have A and B and you have to be paying for part B. Nobody gets away from that. What's happening here in this situation is that they're, the federal government's just passing that part B premium that you're paying to them over to a private insurance company and then giving them some federal tax dollars to make up the difference. So they're well funded in Medicare Advantage to manage your care from top to bottom 
all your benefits under A, all your benefits under B, and a qualified Part D drug program. You do need to live in the plan service area. Now that doesn't mean that your plan won't work for you if you're traveling or if you're going in other places. And over the years, we've seen these plans get very flexible. All of them will cover you in an emergent situation if you're out of your home state, as if it was an in-network event. But we truly do tell people, consider your lifestyle when you're looking at one of these plans, because if you snowbird or if you just envision traveling a lot in your later years, you might feel more encumbered by having to worry about staying within a network of doctors. And original Medicare with a supplement might be a better plan choice for you. But certainly you have to live in the plan service area. Now, should you relocate after choosing one of these plans, that would trigger a special enrollment period for you to make a new plan choice. So Medicare doesn't, you know, they don't lock you in if you have a life-changing event such as a, a relocation. You can't have end-stage renal disease to get one of these plans all of them are offered by private insurance companies and they effectively do take over for Medicare. So an ins a private insurer becomes your primary bill payer. And that's why in the insurance business, we really call these Medicare replacement plans. And then the other nice thing about these plans is they do include some added extra benefits. I mentioned before how this is a highly competitive space, and this is one of the ways that the carriers differentiate themselves from each other, but that they also differentiate their plan offerings from original Medicare. So you might have a friend or family member tell you, gosh, I don't pay anything to see a primary care provider, and I also get two teeth cleanings a year, and I get a free gym club membership, and I get $50 to spend at CVS every quarter, those are the added extras to these plans. I wouldn't advocate buying one of these plans for those bells and whistles, but certainly they're nice that they're there. But the, the main thing is, is that the core medical coverage under these plans, the cost sharing and the prescription drug coverage is really what you wanna look at. And then also your core set of doctors, because at this age in, in most people's lives, um, they've acquired the physicians they're gonna acquire and they don't necessarily wanna change their doctors. So some nice added extra benefits to consider under Medicare Advantage. Next slide. So that's Medicare Advantage. Um, if you guys can't see the chat, just give me a quick minute to take a look at this. David, if I missed anything, why don't you jump in? Well, I would just go back to what you're saying. These Advantage programs are growing in popularity and the competition is driving the market to make them more and more user friendly. Robin talks about a low premium. There's actually some of these programs that could be a zero premium plan, and that's an interesting concept. Over here, that couple, they know they're gonna spend $6,000 whether they go to the doctor or they don't go to the doctor. Now that's nice, they've got massive selection and they've got very limited out of pocket, but six grand is six grand. When you look at one of these Advantage programs, if it's a good fit and you gotta understand it walking in the front door, even on a zero premium plan, we could never call them free because you've got co-payments for absolutely everything that you do. But in a normal year, this couple we know just went to the doctor a total of seven times between the two of them. On an Advantage program, that could have been a 10 or $15 copay for each of those doctor visits and the emergency room was $100 and, and then she had that, uh, that MRI, that was $200. But in a world where they started the year with theoretically $6,000 that they didn't spend here that they have in the cookie jar over here and you're only paying for what you use. If you know those Liberty Mutual commercials, I hate them with the Limu Emu, but I will give them credit. Their tagline, only pay for what you need. That's what you're getting here is the ability to budget based upon betting on you and not necessarily mailing a lot of money off to an insurance company. They're not for everybody. Everything has its pluses and minuses, but this is big, big business and they keep getting more and more user friendly. When they first started, they were all on an HMO chassis and now we actually have zero premium PPO plans that are certainly worth exploring. You wanna look at the entire field of play. So a couple of quick questions that came in about Medicare Advantage, um, primarily related to switching plans. So a couple of things to note, as I mentioned, you can get these plans at any time when you're first enrolling in Medicare during your initial enrollment, or if you're coming to Medicare later during a special enrollment period. And the plans run on a calendar year. So let's say you're coming into Medicare, you turn 65 in June. You'll be in a plan that 
effectively will have a benefit structure until December 31st, and then you can let that plan roll over, or you might consider looking at something and making a change during the annual election period. The first time you ever decide to try one of these plans on for size, any company that you buy it from, by law, based on Medicare guidelines, has to give you what's called a one-year trial right. And basically all that means is that if you decide in the first year that you own one of these plans that it's not working for you, you it's not what you thought it would be, maybe one of your really important doctors fell out of the network um, and you wanna move back to original Medicare, you can do that any month in those first 12 months and you'll have the opportunity to enroll in a Part D prescription drug plan so you're not left without drug coverage and you'll apply for a Medicare supplement apply being the optimal word, because if you're out of that six month window upon activating B, you're gonna to have to answer the medical questions on your application, and potentially if your health is dodgy, you may not get coverage. The one thing about Medicare Advantage that's very different from supplements is there's no medical underwriting ever. So in your lifetime, as you move back and forth on this chart, if you go to Medicare Advantage, you're not gonna be asked anything about your health. and and people always scratch their head and go, well, why is that? Well, because day one, dime one, you're participating in the, in the cost sharing for everything you do in the healthcare system. So the insurance companies have, have figured that out. Some actuary in a room somewhere, I'm sure has run the numbers. And if you're coming with some chronic conditions, you know, there'll be associated co-pays for everything you do in the healthcare system. Unlike supplements that are just standing there waiting to pick up your bills and so they don't want to buy problems. So that's why you're medically underwritten after a certain time on supplements, but you're never medically underwritten on Medicare Advantage. And then as I mentioned before, if you relocate, if you're an original Medicare, you can see any doctor in the US that accepts Medicare. And this was another question that came in. So in theory, your supplement will just go right with you. In that new state, after a certain period of time, you may need to change your drug plan because the drug plans are sold by state. But if you're in Medicare Advantage because Advantage is sold by county and the network of doctors that they've negotiated with are in your home state, you're gonna need, you'll get a special enrollment period that'll last about 60 days upon establishing new residency to make a plan change into, into something else. That looks like that's it in the chat, David. I don't. Okay. Sounds good. So, so there you go. Don't see anything um, else. We're here. back to where we started. Yeah, we were back to where we started with original Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Both good, but both you have to have A and B to do anything else. Once you've got A and B, you'd certainly, if you were in the original side of the equation, that pathway has you picking up a drug program and a supplement or the possibility of an Advantage program. In this field of play, you have many decisions to make and a lot of different timetables to, to understand. The issue here tonight, a little choppy with the chat, apologies for that, but uh, in this world of being virtual, it's not as much fun as being in front of an audience because there's a lot more give and take. But in this world, I hope we've started to open your eyes. There's a lot of questions here still to be answered. And please be happy. Email us. We'll answer those for you on the backside. But what you want to take away from this, a lot of ways to go sideways here. And I would suggest to you that it would be a good thing to have a navigator. And that's what Robin and I do. We're compensated by the insurance companies. There's never a charge to you. What we do is try to help you smooth that learning curve and make smart decisions at no charge to you and no additional fee in what you're buying or what you're paying for. In this world, it's very important to make fully informed decisions. If you got 70% of this here tonight, you get a passing grade. In this world, knowledge is power. And coming up to speed on what your choices are here, critically important, and the ability to make smart choices. Nance, you wanna take us out? Yes, one second, let me get my video back up here. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm back, okay. So thank you so much, David and Robin, for this presentation. Um, uh, we hope to have you back again. Um, we usually have uh, David and Robin at the library a couple times a year. Yeah. So um, that would be in the fall, hopefully, and hopefully we'll be in person at that time. So um, we have many people who attend 
um, this presentation numerous times. Um, this presentation was recorded though, so it will be available on our Elk Grove Village Public Library website, which is www.egvpl.org. Um, I would give that a few days before it's actually up and available for you to watch, but it will be there. Um, so if you have any questions for David and Robin, I know you have their information right there and you can contact them. If you have any questions um, for me about the recording or about anything else at the Elk Grove Public Library, any future programs, any upcoming um, other programming or anything, questions like that, please email me at um, nbroton at egvpl.org. You should have gotten an email from me be before this, so you should have that information. Feel free to email me anytime. Um, and I think that's about it. So David and Robin, thank you so much. And Thanks um, for having us. thank you all for joining us in this uh, Zoom call, uh, Zoom program, and I hope you um, got all the information that you needed. So that's about it. So David and Robin, thank you so much. And Thanks um, for having us. thank you all for joining us in this uh, Zoom call. Uh, Zoom program and hope you um, got all the information that you needed. So we will sign off now. So stay safe and stay be well. Healthy. Thank you for coming. Thanks everybody.